pitch for our next Halcyon lecture. Well, the, 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 it's a two-year term, and it's up to the lecturer when exactly those two years they come. So this will not be next year, but the year following. And indeed, uh, Lord Williams has already given a little bit of a blurb for her in his lecture with Calvin, because it's uh, Marilyn Robinson, Barack Obama's favourite theologian, and of course the, the um, surprise when you offer. So we hope you will all join us again, and of course keep a keen eye on our website if you're not in the faculty uh, to see the right colour lectures are coming up. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, this final lecture. We've had quite an excursion. It began, um, we're told, with Aristotle, but I think <coughs> some also influential theologies of the late 20th century. And Rowan Williams has been reminding us repeatedly, as I looked over our notes, that our relationship to God as the Creator cannot be contrasted. God does not have to grow smaller for human beings to be free. It repeatedly he said that our relationship with the Creator who holds all things in being isn't a zero sum game because God is the ground of our freedom and of all we are. So he's going back to the creative and originary dynamics of the Christian doctrine of creation, which is of course a Christological doctrine, defining it, Byzantine breakthroughs, then Calvin and Bonhoeffer again bringing us back to the idea that Christ's course is nothing but claims everything. This again is not a zero-sum game for, as he said last week, when I meet Christ at my edge, I find my center. So we're all looking forward to today's lecture, In Whom All Things Cohere, Christ and the Logic of Finite Being. Thank you very much indeed. I rather hope that uh, for the Halcyon Lecture, the one after next, we're not going to look for Donald Trump's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I want to begin this week by recapitulating some of the argument that has been underlying these lectures as a whole, and to see if we can move towards anything like a conclusion. And so, to begin with, I'll just trace step by step the evolution of the Christological argument as I've tried to follow it through in these weeks. Thinking about Christology, thinking systematically about the person of Christ, begins, I've argued, from the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was seen and understood as acting in the place or in the role of Israel's God. We can think about it. He was seen as bringing about the kind of change associated with God in Jewish tradition. Bringing about the kind of change associated with God. And that kind of change includes the creation of the people. The acting out or acting through of covenanted faithfulness, even in the face of betrayal. So one way of understanding the resurrection is as a restoration or reaffirmation of covenanted relation. There's the reintegration of the lost or strayed children of Abraham into the covenant community through forgiveness and reaffirmation of their status. And there's the delivery of ultimate judgment about the destiny of human individuals, whether on the last day or as in the fourth gospel, in every event of encounter. Jesus takes the place of Israel's God. He brings about the kind of change associated with God. He calls, he forgives, he judges. But in addition to this, he was seen not only as modeling a particular style of prayerful relationship, but as actively animating prayerful relationship. By the presence of his spirit, what happens in him happens in those who are associated with him. Happens in his spiritual progeny, those who are in Christ. You remember from the second lecture, a discussion of what it might mean to be in Christ, as if in a kinship relationship, a relationship to an ancestor. What happens in him happens in the believer. And what happens in Christ is both 
prayer to the God he addresses as Abba, and the exercise of his liberty of forgiveness and the integration of strangers and strays into the people of God. <coughs> that some of what we mean by saying that Jesus is seen as acting in the place or the role of Israel's <coughs> And the identity of Jesus and of his community is bound up with the promise of a new covenantal and communal belonging, which is open to all, increasingly interpreted as involving those outside the limits of historic Israel. And so both Jesus and his community are understood as having the responsibility of advocating for the harmony and well-being of the entire human family. Jesus and the body of Christ are there for the well-being of the entire world, on the theory we were thinking through last week. So these themes of a Jesus who takes the part, the role of the God of Israel, who also speaks as advocate for the human family, and all the themes that <coughs> radiate from those, these are seldom if ever laid out systematically in Christian scripture. But they do represent the convergent ideas and images of a spread of very diverse writers in the first Christian generation. So that's where we begin. But the paradox in this picture, of course, is the simultaneous affirmation of prayerful dependence <coughs> and divine initiative. Prayerful dependence and divine initiative. As Christological discourse evolves over the first three centuries or so, the options are gradually clarified. So as to make it clear, that compromising one or other of those terms upsets the entire scheme. If you compromise over the unconditionality of divine initiative in Jesus, you can't sustain that position without damage to the very concept of God. That is, you end up by postulating some kind of second-class divine agents or something like that. The highly elevated, almost eternal but not quite, divine beings that hung around quite a lot in late antique <laughs> cosmology <laughs> and who were readily identifiable in some ways with some kind of quasi-divine intervention in the world and that's really the system that Arius attempts to systematize further in the fourth century. But equally if you compromise over the contingent and dependent character of Jesus' human activity, you end up with a scheme that can't be sustained without damaging the basic conviction that Jesus acts as an advocate for those whose experience he shares. And that stress on Jesus as advocate for those whose experience he shares is from the writings of Ignatius of Antioch onwards, a key theme in early Christian writing. So, weaken the emphasis on divine initiative, weaken the emphasis on human solidarity, and the entire <coughs> pattern dissolves. That then is the paradox, which is to be addressed in early Christian speculation. And the first step, the only first step of resolving this, is the Nicene doctrine of what might be called an analogue of creativeness within the divine life. That's to say, within the eternal divine life, there is a way of living the divine life in the mode of receiving and responding, which is at the same time truly divine in being possessed of unconditional freedom and so having the inseparable effect of divinity within the finite world. There is within God something like the dependence of the creature, really this the dependence of the word or the son or the father. And the second step, beyond Nicaea, is to begin to explore what might then be said about the union of this dimension of divine life, this way of living the divine life, with an actual finite inhabitant of the universe, 
As we've seen, the necessity of conserving the two poles of the original discourse, dependence and liberty, means that it's not possible to locate God as an agent among others within the finite order. Grammatically, so to speak, God can't be intelligibly represented in this way, so that any affirmation of divine agency within the finite world must be in the form of genuinely finite action. A basic paradox, the infinite can only act within the finite, in finite form. And the post-Chalcedonian model, which we looked at in the third of these lectures, of the composite hypostasis of the eternal word, offers a structure which allows us to say that God is literally and personally acting within the world, but does so in the sense that a finite agent, Jesus of Nazareth, acts in such unbroken alignment <coughs> with the word's way of being God, <coughs> acts in contemplative dependence, unrestricted response, in unbroken and unconditional filial love and self-giving, that the effect of this action is continuous with the effect of divine action in Israel's history, and ultimately with divine action in the act of creation itself. Now, in the writers of the patristic period, notably Athanasius, there are hints that the eternal generation of the Word and the life of the Trinity is a sort of eternal type and ground of the bringing into being of a finite world. That God is Trinity, that the life of God is generative or relation, is a key to seeing creation as free, but so to speak, not surprising. That's to say, given the kind of God you have, it's the kind of thing such a God might do. Not that one can never stand outside and make that kind of calculation, which is what I mean. And I think what Athanasius is saying is there is therefore a continuity between the way in which the everlasting God generates within the divine life, that relationship, and the generation of relationship with what is not God. The Word, as the eternal form of dependence, is the ground, the optimal form of dependent reality. Creation's relation to God, in other words, is in some sense analogous to the Son's relation to the Father. And since the Son's relation to the Father is not that of one thing to another thing, but an unimaginatively intimate existence in the other, a non-duality that's not a simple identity, since that's the case, we are steered towards a similar model an identical and similar model of the relation between creator and creation. Creator and creation are not two items that could conceivably be parted in any list. There is no whole of which creator and creation are two bits. But the difference, what makes this an analogy, not a parallel instance, is that this relational complex, in the case of the father and the son, is eternal and entirely reciprocal. But in the case of creation, it has a beginning and is asymmetrical. God would be God without the world. And yet, and this presumably is something like Bonhoeffer's point in some of the texts I was looking at last week. Yet, God has so acted as to make himself not conceivable or speakable outside this relation. God has so acted that it is now the case that to speak truthfully about God, to speak fully and adequately about God, is to speak in connection with this relation, creator and creature. And so the relation between creator and creation is like that of the eternal hypostasis of the word to the human <coughs> substance that is Jesus, as it was described both by the Byzantines and by Aquinas. The word, remember, is what it is independently of any created state of affairs. And the created state of affairs that is the life of Jesus depends <coughs> wholly upon this prior unified eternal action. But if we want to speak adequately and truthfully of the word in action, we speak of Jesus above all else. And we understand the unity of the word's action as embracing, sustaining, 
the event of Jesus, and of that event being itself divine word and divine act, enabling our word and our acts of witness. To speak of the relation between creator and creation as analogous to that between father and son is a risky and complex business. But I would say that it is one of the things that emerges out of the consideration of the history of Christological discourse, making some kind of sense of the complex way in which we want to say of divinity and humanity of Jesus, there is alterity, there is otherness, but not the otherness of <coughs> summing things together, the otherness of addition. And that means, of course, that there is no alterity between creator and creation or word and humanity in Jesus, as we normally understand alterity, otherness. Just as there is no alterity, as we understand it, between father and son. They are not two instances of something. But the further, and in some ways more interesting implication, is this. Creation is most fully itself when it is aligned with sharing in the kind of dependency which the Son has <coughs> towards the Father. The goal of creation as such is to relate to the Creator as the Son does to the Father. Creation, therefore, must include the possibility of finite creatures endowed with love and intelligence after the image of the sun. The focal point of the created order is that this love and intelligence, which we recognize as distinctively present in humanity, as far as we know. We have no knowledge of what other instances there may be in the universe of love and intelligence and how they relate to incarnation or trinity. We do not know the theology of Alpha Centauri. We don't need to. <laughs> but from our point of view in the universe as we experience it, creation is at its optimal level of action and well-being when finite love and intelligence are in accord with the uncreated love and intelligence that the word eternally exercises. And this is the sense in which Christ is at the heart of creation, or the apex of creation, depending on which sort of imagery you prefer. Christ at the heart of creation as the one in whom, as finite substance, the movement or the energy of eternal filial love and understanding is fully active. If we take a broadly Thomist viewpoint, this represents the restoring of a lost or occluded capacity in humanity the restoration of the capacity to be a mediatorial presence in creation. But, although humanity, with its love and intelligence, is created to hold that unifying and mediatorial position of creation, a lineage of failure has been created, a lineage of deprivation and distortion, so that the new beginning of the event of Jesus Christ as to establish a new kind of lineage, a new kinship, as I call it. And as Maximus the Confessor's vision of the universe affirms, this healing of humanity and its capacities unlocks the possibility of a universal reconciliation, a reconciliation figured in the sacramental life of the body of Christ. So we moved from the initial puzzles, you might say, over the dual perception of Jesus, a perception of divine initiative and divine effect, a perception of dependence. Move from that through to the complicated disentangling of the divine and the human that the first three centuries of Christian theology represent, and having disentangled two threads they are now being woven together, plaited tightly together once again, in Byzantine and medieval 
so that we understand that it is in virtue of the word of God being unequivocally possessed of the divine initiative that we can speak of the humanity animated by the word of God as unequivocally united with our humanity. And in that union, <coughs> doing something that affects and transfigures the possibilities of the entire creation. So that the body of Christ, the kinship of Christ still existing in the world, has a key role in creation itself as it now works or fails to work. So that's the kind of story that I've been trying to trace in these lectures. The way in which, from an apparent aporia, apparent brick wall, in the original conceptuality, we move towards a metaphysic of difference, analogy, participation. And I've traced that a bit further in the post-Reformation period in Calvin and Bonhoeffer to show how even outside some of the classical frameworks of metaphysics, some of the same points come through about the non-competitive quality of the relationship <coughs> and, of course, about the significance of incarnation in connection with the continuing life of the Word in the world through the body of Christ. I want now to turn to the modern theologian who I think has probably done the most to keep these things in balance, but has done so in work of such formidable complexity that it takes a great deal of effort to disentangle once again, and that is the Jesuit Erich Kivara. Kivara, who was one of Bart's most significant interlocutors in the 1930s, one of the major influences on Hans Urs von Balthasar, Givara's work of Analogia Entis, recently translated into something like English, <laughs> from an original which is something like German. <laughs> I hasten to read I first read it in French translation. <laughs> Givara sees his metaphysic of analogy as Christologically focused, because for him, what we say about God as the unconditional fullness of active existence must be, therefore, affirmation that in God is also a possibility of finite representation, infinite diversity. And so Shivara in Analogia Entis says that God is the middle through whom all the antitheses pass. The antithesis between the one and the many. The antithesis between the primate and the infinite. And that positioning of God in the middle, the God in whom these apparent contradictions converge, that is known to us, enacted for us in Jesus Christ. So he writes, Christ appears as the reality of the way in which God, the middle, takes up the all, the unifying head of everything. Giovanni develops this as an interpretation of Aquinas' um, Summa 3.8, where Aquinas is discussing <coughs> the role of Christ as head in various ways. And again, and you see what I mean about the style, in Christ, the below of the creature is assumed into personal unity with the infinite above and beyond. And this assumption of the creature below into the infinite beyond is not only a manifestation in human form, not a showing forth an epiphany of divine life as such. It's a manifestation in the form of the cross. We'll see what this means later. It's the cross, the humiliated finite existence of the word, quote, rather than some neutral crown of creation, that is the means of assumption of the finite into the infinite. Only in the incarnate word is it possible both to be directly in contact with infinite activity and to grasp the always greater, the semper maior, of theological analogy. The principle that there's no similarity 
between God and creation without an always greater difference. There in Christ, Chivaro writes, is man wholly circumscribed in his humanity, in whose humanity there is nothing visible, audible, scrutable or tangible that would immediately suggest divinity. Distant echo of Kierkegaard yet again. <coughs> but who precisely as such is the embodied act of God. Jesus Christ by being unequivocally without what we would regard as the marks of divinity is supremely the embodiment of God's act. And that's why Christian identity Das Christliche is the end point of creaturely becoming. More about that later. But I hope you'll see in the next bit of what I want to say how Juvara offers a way of holding together the strands of argument and insight that I've been trying to tease out of the writers I've been looking at so far. As I was saying to Professor Soskis before the lecture, the um, Attempt to understand Shivara means that either you're subjected to some six hours of close exposition of rather resistant texts, or you have an almost incomprehensible summary. I've opted for the almost incomprehensible summary, as <laughs> 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 you've noticed. But what Shivara does is to show us how Christology becomes a key to the logic of creation. Christ becomes the perfectly creature. Jesus Christ is what creation should look like. That's to say, creation coming to its fruition, coming to its purposed point in that relation of intimate, unbroken, filial dependence, love, contemplation, and so forth. Finite existence in itself, just as finite existence, is just Shavala says, a matter of uninterrupted becoming, the bare reality of process. But of course, finite existence is never just in itself. It's always in relation to the infinite. It's always being drawn and shaped by the infinite act from which it has its origin. Finite existence doesn't simply lie around existing. It has a history of responding to the gift of the infinite. And so, like it or not, it's caught up in analogy, in greater or lesser alignment to the infinite, non-processual movement of God to God. <coughs> Time is the moving image of eternity, is a good um, metaphysical cliche from a certain generation. But the eternity of which time is the moving image is, for Shibara, a trinitarian eternity. And that's what makes the difference. The movement of God to God, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, into and through and with one another, that movement, that helichoresis, the Trinity, that is what the movement of finite reality towards full communion with God images. So in embodying the Word's relation to the Father, Jesus embodies also the maximal and optimal relation of creature to creator. And he does so as unequivocally finite, fully human. He exercises human nature as it is created to be. And it is created to be mediatorial. To exercise human nature in that way is to accept the mediatorial role in creation, to accept answerability for creation, as Bonhoeffer defines it. And just as the Word and the Father, as I've said, are not two egos who could only expand into each other's space, so creator and creation are not two determinate substances locked in rivalry. The perfect, supreme, unique presence of the infinite in the finite is a moment where we can speak of a perfect creatureliness. That's the paradox. That's also the focal insight of Shivara's theology and metaphysics, and I would suggest it's the natural working through 
epistemological themes we've been examining. And to refer again to a very different metaphysician, the one with whom I began these lectures, Austin Farrer. Farrer writes once again in The Glass of Vision on the very concept of a supernatural act, which must, he says, be an act absolutely continuous with natural activity. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the agent's act at all. It's never cut off from its natural base, but it's also an act enabled to receive the maximal flow of infinite energy, according to its capacity. And while the idiom is different, as I say, <coughs> the insight, I think, is comparable. For Jesus to be the embodiment of the Word of God is inseparable from Jesus being perfectly creature. No finite system of action can be God, since every finite system of action is reactive, composite, and so forth. And the integrity of such systems has to be preserved if we are to understand the gratuity of creation. And that's why God must, must in inverted commas, must act in a finite world through finite means. God cannot be identical as God, with one agent among others, in a sum total of agents. Otherwise, his act would dissolve the integrity of what is made. And the doctrine of the Incarnation clarifies this double grammar of God and creation. So going back to Jivara's Analogia Entis, in fact, this time to some of the rather later essays that are appended to the later <coughs> of that work and appear in the English translation. This, in particular, an essay um, between metaphysics and Christology. Shivara says that... I think really can spell Shivara. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a surprise. Shivara <laughs> 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 notes that the fact of Jesus is what answers the question of quincid deus, what is God? Both in terms of what the grammar of God must be, what kind of thing must we be talking about to be talking about God, and in terms of what sort of God we are talking about. What sort of things do we need to be saying about God to be talking about God? And if God is wholly other to the finite, then, as we've seen paradoxically, only the finite can adequately express what God is. The finite that is Jesus of Nazareth. Negative theology, reminding us that we can't say anything positive about what, about what it is like to be God, negative theology clears the way to the grammar of an infinite divine existence, infinite and so not capable of being categorized or included in any kind of generic state. But that shows us that in Christ, what is happening in Christ, the perfectly creaturely, is the appropriate way in which the divine and the infinite appears. And beware, says Rivara at this point, beware of thinking that this simply means that the humanity of Jesus is a supremely impressive humanity which reminds you of the supreme impressiveness of God. Just like Bart, in fact, Jivara is insistent that the risk of, as it were, thinking of Jesus as divine because Jesus is a very impressive human being, is to collapse the categories yet again. And so he moves from that into an intense, very, very complicated meditation on how the way in which the unknowable God becomes speakable in Jesus has to be seen in terms of in relation to human failure and loss. Back to the point I noted earlier. It's not simply a manifestation of divinity in humanity we're talking about, but it's a manifestation of divinity in humiliated, mortal suffering humanity. Not just the paradox, says Rivara of the infinite and the finite, but the deeper challenge 
seeing God in a perfectly creaturely, which is the cross. That which is fully aligned with divine love, even in the midst of created freedom and full revolt. The abnegation of finite liberty and power, that is the cross, is the appropriate finite word for God. Nothing in the world that pretended to be godlike could in fact be an analogy for God. Because the very fact of something in the world pretending to be godlike would secure the fact that it wasn't. So that which is as ungodlike as you can imagine, the humiliation of the cross, becomes the appropriate, the apt, you might almost say, the necessary way in which the infinite appears. <coughs> And reverting to the theology of Maximus yet again, it is now the emptying of power and the absolute immobilization and silencing that is the cross which establishes the analogy between Jesus and God, the analogy between the relation of creation to creator and the relation of the word to father. This, as you see, is an intensely worked and often very convoluted way into the subject. And I apologize for not making it clearer. But my reason for touching on Shivara at the end of these lectures is simply, as I've said, that he seems to me of near contemporary theologians, the one who most clearly sees that function of Christology in a balanced Christian reading of our universe is both to establish what called the grammar of creator and creation, and in all sorts of ways, helpfully to confuse, helpfully to upturn the assumptions with which we might approach such apparently clarificatory Shivara helps us to see that the ultimate empty of godlikeness or power, that is the cross, is indeed the appropriate place for an unconditional divine freedom to be manifest. So, moving towards some kind of confusion. <coughs> I promise there's no more Shivara. <laughs> I've been arguing that the analysis of the Christological tradition illuminates not only the grammar of God, what do we need to be saying God is in order to be talking about God, but only the grammar of God, but the mode in which God may be spoken or spoken of. If Shivara is right, the cross is where God is most spoken most clearly audible in the silence of Christ's death. And therefore, for us as believers, God becomes speakable in our shouldering of the cross, in Bonhoeffer's prayer and just action, in the self-dispossession of prayer and the taking of responsibility for well-being of neighbor and world. God becomes speakable in a licensed theory, but in a mode of life which embodies that crucified surrender. Likewise, what has to be said about God becomes inseparable from ecclesiology, from the doctrine of the church. Because throughout the interpretations of Christology we've been looking at in these lectures, the themes come back again and again that Jesus of Nazareth is compelling, interesting, converting, startling, <laughs> because it's theologically impossible to treat him as an individual. We are in him. We are his progeny. We are his kin. And he's not to be seen or understood apart from his kin. Interweaving all of these themes helps us to see why Christological discourse 
of the classical kind, as represented in Chalcedon and reflection on it, and the medieval elaborations of it, and the Reformation refinements of it, Christological discourse of the classical kind develops as part of how an ecology, not only of theology, but of the life of discipleship evolves. And to see how all these things interweave helps us to see why it's still, I'd say, crucial to the balance of all theological language and theologically informed action. I've argued throughout that Christological formulations are not a kind of metaphysical compliment to the greatness of Jesus, so good that he had to be God. Nor are they the doctrine of divine manifestation in human glory and persuasiveness. St. So Paul dealt with that long ago in 1 and 2 Corinthians. Nor is the coming of the Word of God in Jesus of Nazareth an isolated miracle that could have happened in another medium, as some late medievals seemed to be arguing. None of these things are bound up with the logic of creativeness itself and with the vision of humanity within creation and the distinctive role of humanity within creation. And I should perhaps add in brackets that to talk about the distinctive vision of humanity within creation in the mode I've suggested particularly in relation to something like Maximus's theory of Logos and Logoi, is not to suggest an anthropocentric model of creation in the malign sense, <coughs> creation whose purpose is simply to serve humanity. On the contrary, humanity is at the center of this cosmology. It's the other way around. It is that humanity has a role, a destiny or vocation, animating the vocation of the true being of all creation, therefore attending deeply and selflessly to the logic of the creative order as it is. And my purpose in following through the history of Christological reflection, and there would have been other theologians who might have served my purpose for this work. The purpose of following this through is to see how these themes do interweave. It's a history that has sometimes been distorted by one or another style of reduction of the full scope of the doctrine. I mentioned some of those reductions just a moment ago. But at the end of the day, once again, we are challenged as to whether and how our Christological language represents a reality which has a claim on us. Austin Farrer, once again, in the same lecture I've already quoted, reflects on whether the priority of contemplating the mystery should push out any sense of obligation to be metaphysical about it. He replies, either our contemplation holds something real in view, or else it is a mere sensuous enjoyment, or a mere emotional attitude. So again, the point of this exercise is to trace the scale of the reality we are seeking to contemplate in this way. To see our logic, not only of creation, but of church and practical Christian service, depend on the close connections of thought we've been trying amateurishly to disentangle in reading these great figures of the Christian past. So, a mature Christology, or church, in the light of all this, is, I would maintain, one that doesn't seek to mythologize the doctrine, or to project finite forms of alterity onto God. I think that's the problem of some kinds of sharply defined Trinitarian pluralisms, or indeed sharply defined doctrines of the suffering of God and Jesus. I think that saving the grammatical proprieties about the nature of God is not just metaphysical fussiness of the wrong sort, combined with a distrust of finite reality. It's affirming the divine freedom and the divine character, and so allowing the finite to be itself 
about magical or opportunistic interruption from the infinite. And as the early Christian theologians knew very well, it's a way of safeguarding the full humanity of Christ. So I'm entirely in accord with those who want to see the Chalcedonian formula as genuinely safeguarding two kinds of nature. Consideration. But as that patristic doctrine has been perfected on and refined over the centuries, something rather sharper comes into focus buried in that doctrine, which is that safeguarding the full difference of each is precisely safeguarding the reality of the finite as well as the infinite. And the full development of some of these themes in a direction such as that which Javara suggests gives the key to the meaning of an entire finite scheme, the entire scheme of reality as we know it. God continues to act in the act he has initiated in the finite world. God does so in any number of ways, day by day and second by second, but focally and uniquely that act becomes knowable and shareable in the restoration of human dignity and capacity in Christ. <coughs> Not by conversion of God into flesh, but by taking the manhood into God, as somebody once put it. And so, for us, the gift is to become capable at once of accepting our creaturehood, our finite reality, as it is and can be in Christ, and simultaneously.